Elijah. The prophet Elijah shines forth as one of the most resplendent stars in the firmament of human spiritual evolution, and the great illumination he brought to humanity in olden times has endured even to the present day. The deeds, the characteristics, the greatness of this outstanding personality, as portrayed in the ancient biblical records, make the profoundest impression upon the hearts and feelings of humanity. Nevertheless, this significant figure seems difficult to comprehend with respect to external history. We are about to consider Elijah from the standpoint of spiritual science. Viewed in its light, we find in the very nature of his being an indication that the most important causes and motives underlying the circumstances connected with earthly existence during human evolution are not dependent merely upon those ideas that may be consciously apprehended and the results of which can be recognized externally as forming a part of life's history. For we learn that those very impulses that move us to actions of greatest import are born within the confines of the soul. In order that this truth, which sheds so great a light upon the world's history, may become apparent to our spiritual vision, we need only recall the fact that Christianity owes its foundation, for the most part, to that profound psychic incident experienced by St. Paul, Saul, which found outward expression in the vision near Damascus, Acts 9.3. No matter how much we may argue concerning the reality and nature of this external happening, it cannot be denied that the true origin of Christianity is intimately connected with what then took place in the soul and spirit of that great apostle and righteous founder of the Christian faith, and that the knowledge and enlightenment which came to him was passed on to humankind through the medium of his flaming words and self-sacrificing deeds. In many other cases it can be proved that primary causes and impulses underlying events that happen during the historical unfoldment of human existence cannot be identified with normal external occurrences, for their inception may often be traced to the hearts and souls of humanity. We are now about to consider an example of this very nature in connection with the personality of Elijah and the period in which he lived. Since my lecture must of necessity be both brief and sketchy in character, though treating of a subject covering so wide a field, the question as to how far the matter presented will elucidate and provide new evidence concerning the progress of human historical evolution in this special instance must be left for your further consideration, but your thoughts should at all times be guided by the deep promptings of the soul. The object of my discourse is not merely to supply information concerning the personality and significance of the prophet Elijah. Its true purport is at the same time to present an example of the manner in which spiritual science weighs and regards such matters, and by virtue of the means at its disposal, can shed fresh light upon facts connected with the growth and development of humanity, which have come to our knowledge through other sources. With this end in view, we will employ a special method in dealing with our subject. In the first place, statements that are the result of the investigations of spiritual science and have reference to the personality and significance of Elijah will be as independent as possible of all connection with the Bible as a source. And such references will be made only when they seem essential in connection with names and descriptions. We will therefore first endeavor to portray all pertinent events as they actually happened and later draw attention to the manner in which they are depicted in the ancient biblical records. The occurrences will be set forth just as they are revealed by the researches of spiritual science, which researches have formed the basis of the various portrayals presented both in the lectures of this series 
and in others of previous years. A large number of my audience, who through long years of experience with the methods of spiritual science have gained confidence in its power and proved substantiality, will accept from the very first all that I propose to bring forward and regard it as trustworthy and as the result of conscientious investigation. This will be the case, even though my subject must of necessity be treated in a somewhat sketchy manner, because an exposition involving detailed proofs would require many hours for its complete presentation. To those of my audience who have had no such experience, as I have mentioned, I would suggest that they look upon all that is said concerning the authentic historical narrative that I am about to unfold as if it were in the nature of an hypothesis underlying which is a substratum of positive evidence. I am certain that if they will do, if they will but do this and make a reasonable and understanding attempt in moderation and without prejudice to obtain the required evidence, all my statements will ultimately receive entire confirmation. What now has spiritual science to say concerning the personality and significance of the prophet Elijah and his period? To understand this, we must go back in thought to those ancient Hebrew times, when the brilliant epoch that marked the reign of Solomon was past, and the kingdom of Palestine was enduring many and varied forms of privation. We must recall the troubles of the Philistines and other similar incidents and transport ourselves in mind to those days when all that formerly constituted a united and centralized monarchy was divided into the separate kingdoms of Judah and Israel, and King Ahab, who was the son of Omri, reigned in Samaria. Here we have found an opportunity to introduce biblical names, but we have done so merely for the sake of clarity and corroboration, as will often be the case as we proceed. Between King Ahab, or rather between his father and the king of Tyre and Sidon, there was a close relationship. A sort of alliance had been formed. This compact was further strengthened by the marriage of Ahab with Jezebel, a daughter of the royal house. I am making use of these names as they are familiar to us from the Bible and so that my subject may be more easily understood. We are looking back into an age when that ancient clairvoyant gift that was in general a spiritual attribute of the human being in primeval times had by no means entirely disappeared among those people who had still retained the necessary and fitting disposition. Now, Queen Jezebel was endowed with this gift, and her clairvoyant powers were of a very special order. These powers, however, she did not always employ in ways destined to promote that which was good and noble. While we look upon Jezebel as a kind of clairvoyant, we must regard King Ahab as a man who only under exceptional circumstances evinced a faculty through which the hidden forces of his soul could break in upon his conscious state. In olden times, such manifestations were much more in evidence and more widely spread than is the case today. There were occasions when Ahab himself experienced visions and presentiments, but never to any marked degree extent and they occurred only when he was confronted with some special matter connected with human destiny. At the time to which I refer, a rumor had spread throughout the land that a remarkable spirit was abroad. In reality, this was none other than he who, in the Bible records, bears the name of Elijah. There were few among those living in the outer world who knew precisely in what place the personality that bore this name might be found nor did they know in what way or by what means he exerted so powerful an influence upon contemporaneous people and events. We can perhaps best describe the situation by saying that throughout the widest circles any reference to this mysterious being, or even the mention of his name, was accompanied by a thrill of awe. Because of this it was generally felt that this spirit must possess some singular and hidden attribute of greatest import. But no one knew rightly or had indeed any idea 
in what way this unusual quality might manifest or where it might be sought. Only certain isolated persons, whom we might term initiates, had true knowledge of what was really taking place, and they alone knew where, in the physical world, they might find the outer reality of the actual individual who was the bearer of this mysterious spirit. King Ahab was also ignorant concerning these matters, but nevertheless he experienced a peculiar feeling of apprehension, and a kind of dread overcame him whenever mention was made of that incomprehensible being regarding whom the most extravagant notions prevailed, as was only natural under the circumstances. Ahab was that king of Samaria who, through his alliance with Tyre and Sidon, had introduced into the ancient kingdom of Palestine a certain religious order that held to outer forms and ceremonies and found expression through external symbolism, in other words, a species of heathenism. Such information concerning the individuality of Elijah as came to the followers of this pagan form of worship must have created in them a strange and peculiar feeling of fear and dismay. For it was evident from what they heard that the Yahweh religion, as it may be termed, had now indeed come down to them from bygone days by the ancient Hebrew peop- of the ancient Hebrew people and was once more active. There was still a belief in one God, in one great spiritual being in the cosmos, who rules over the super-perceptual realm and who by means of its forces makes his influence felt and affects both the evolution and the history of humanity. It was further realized that the time was approaching when there would be an ever greater and more significant understanding of Yahweh among those who were the most advanced and perfect of the descendants of the old Hebrew race. It was well known that in truth the religion of Moses contained the germ of all that one might term the Yahweh religion. But this fact had been grasped by the nation in a manner more or less after the fashion of a people yet in a stage of childhood or early youth. The old faith with its upturned vision toward a supersensible God may be described only in this way. It can be likened to nothing else than to an awareness of contact with that which is invisible and superperceptual, which comes to humans when they indeed apprehend and realize their own true ego. It was this consciousness of the supersensible that had descended upon the people. But the concept they had formed, as far as they could form any concept at all, was based upon an attempt to picture to themselves the workings of Yahweh as conceived from their experiences of the external phenomena of life. In those days it was the custom to say that Yahweh acted with regard to humanity in such a manner that when all nature was luxuriant and fruitful, it was a sign that he was rewarding humanity and showering benefits upon the nation. On the other hand, when the people suffered from want and distress, brought about by war, scarcity of food and other causes, they cried out that Jehovah had turned his face away and was consumed with anger. At that time about which we are speaking, the nation was enduring the miseries caused by a period of death and starvation. Many turned aside from the God Yahweh because they could no longer believe in his works when they saw how he treated humanity, for there was a terrible famine in the land. If indeed we can speak of progress in connection with the Yahweh conception, then the progress destined to be made by these ancient Hebrew people can be characterized in the following manner. The nation must henceforth form a new Yahweh concept, embodying the old thoughts and ideas, through which must flow a fuller and a higher order of human understanding, so that all might say that no matter what shall take place in the outer world, whether we live in happiness or are beset with sorrows and privations, we must realize that such external events are in no way evidence of either the wrath or the benevolence of Yahweh. True devotion to God and a proper comprehension of the Yahweh concept implies that humankind will at all times gaze upward unswervingly toward the invisible deity 
uninfluenced by the contemplation of outer happenings and things or the apparent reality of material impressions. Even though we meet with the direst want and affliction, through those inner forces alone that dominate the soul, human beings shall come to the sure conviction that He is. This great revolution in religious outlook was destined to be consummated and wrought through the power of the prophet Elijah. Bracket, and, as will be seen later, his spiritual force operated at times through the medium of a chosen human personality. Close bracket. When it is ordained that some great momentous change shall be brought about in the concepts of humanity, as was the case in Elijah's day, it is necessary in the beginning that there be certain fitting personalities at hand in whose souls can be implanted the germ, so to speak, of those things ordained later to enter into the history of humanity. The manner in which the seed thus laid finds fitting expression is always that of a new impulse and a new force. If you will not misunderstand my meaning, I would say that it was decreed in accordance with the preordained fate of the nation that the individuality known as the prophet Elijah should be chosen one whose soul should first grasp the Jehovah concept in the form I have described. To this end, it was essential that certain singular and very special forces be called up from the hidden depths of his soul, deep-seated powers as yet unknown to humankind and unguessed at even by the teachers of that time. Something in the nature of a holy, mystical initiation of the highest order through which might come the revelation of such a God had first to take place in the innermost being of Elijah. It is therefore of the utmost importance in order to describe in characteristic manner the way in which the Yahweh concept was instilled in the minds of the people that we should gaze into the soul of that particular human personality in whom the spirit that was to impart the primary impulse was incarnated or embodied. That man who through the nature of his divine initiation became imbued with all the latent forces of his soul. These were forces vital to one who would strike the first deep fundamental note that would call forth and make possible the coming Yahweh conception. Such great spiritual personalities as Elijah, who are chosen to experience within the soul the first stimulating impress of some momentous forward impulse, stand for the most part isolated and alone. In olden days, however, there gathered around them certain followers who came from the great religious schools or schools of the prophets, as they were called in Palestine, and which by other nations have been termed initiation or mystery sanctuaries. Thus, we find the prophet Elijah, if we would use this name, also surrounded by a few earnest disciples, who looked up to him in reverence as one exalted far above them. These disciples realized to some extent the true nature and significance of Elijah's mission, even though because of their limited spiritual vision they were unable to penetrate deeply into the soul of their great master. At that time strange events had begun to pl take place in the land. The people, however, had no idea of where the mysterious personality might be found who had brought them about. They could say only, quote, He must be here or there, for something unusual is happening. Close quote. Hence it was that there spread abroad what we might term a sort of rumor, if the word is not misused, to the effect that he, a prophet, was actually at work, but no one knew rightly where. This uncertainty was due to the exercise of a definite and peculiar influence that could be exerted by all such advanced spiritual beings as are found among outstanding seers. Viewed in the light of our modern times, it is probable that such a statement appears somewhat grotesque, but those who are acquainted with the singular characteristics of that long-ago age will find it in no way fanciful or extravagant. All truly exalted spiritual personalities, such as Elijah, 
were endowed with this specific and highly penetrative quality, which made itself felt now here and now there. The activity of this potent influence manifested in feelings of awe and dread, and there was also a direct positive action through which it entered little by little into the souls of the people. It there operated in such a manner as to cause them to be unable to tell at times just where the external form of some great spiritual personality might be found. But the true followers and disciples of Elijah knew well where to seek him and were further quite aware that his outer individuality might perchance assume a wholly unpretentious character and come to light in connection with some quite lowly station in earthly life. It is remarkable that at the time about which I am speaking, the actual bearer of the spirit of Elijah was a close neighbor of Ahab, king of Samaria, and the possessor of a small property in his immediate vicinity. But Ahab had no suspicion that such was the case. He sought everywhere for this singular being whose presence was felt so mysteriously throughout the community and whom he regarded with feelings of awe and wonder, even as did his people. He entirely failed, however, to take into consideration the simple and unassuming landowner who lived so near him and gave no thought as to why he should at times absent himself nor where he went on these occasions. But Jezebel, being clairvoyant, had discovered that this unobtrusive personality had actually become the external physical embodiment of the spirit of Elijah. The knowledge she had thus acquired she did not impart to Ahab. She kept it to herself, regarding it as a secret for reasons that will become apparent later. In the Bible this particular character upon whose innermost being Elijah's spirit worked, is known by the name of Naboth. We thus see that according to the investigations of spiritual science, we must recognize in the Naboth of the Bible the physical bearer of the spiritual individuality of Elijah. It was in those days that a great famine came upon the land, and there were many who hungered. Naboth, in certain ways, also experienced want and distress. At times such as these, when not only does hunger prevail, as was assuredly the case in Palestine, but when on every side there is also a feeling of infinite pity for those who suffer, the conditions are especially favorable for the entry of latent soul forces into one already prepared through destiny or karma. It is alone through these hidden powers of the soul that human beings may raise themselves to the level of such a mission as we have outlined. Let us clearly picture what takes place deep within the being under such circumstances and thus gain an understanding of the manner in which Naboth's soul was affected. In the initial stage there is an inner progressive change or unfoldment marked by an important period of self-education and self-development. It is extremely difficult to describe those inner experiences of the soul that tend to raise it to greater spiritual heights, while the personality is becoming imbued with the forces by means of which it will be enabled to look upon the world of spirit. The power of divine spiritual vision must next be called into being, so that there may arise the wisdom necessary to the inception of all vital impulses destined to be implanted in the stream of human evolution. A verbal description is here the more difficult because never once have those who have undergone an experience of this nature, especially in olden times, come to such a state of apperception that they could outline their impressions in a precise and lucid manner. What actually happens may be stated to be somewhat as follows. The clairvoyant development of the soul is accomplished through different stages. In the case of a being such as Naboth, it would naturally occur that his first inner experience would be the clear apprehension of the following definite concept. 
the spiritual power that is ordained to descend upon humanity will now shine forth in me, and I am its appointed receptacle. Close quote. Next would come this thought, quote, I must henceforth do all that in me lies, so that the force within my being may find true and proper expression, and that I may acquire those qualities that shall fit me to cope with every form of trial and experience that may come upon me. Thus shall I know how to impart the power of divine impulse to my fellows in proper fashion. Close quote. It is in this way that the spiritual and clairvoyant development of a personality, such as I have described, must go forward, step by step. When a suitable, predetermined stage has been reached, then follow certain definite and noticeable signs that manifest within the soul. These are also of the nature of inner experiences. They are neither dreams nor visions for they owe their origin to and are dependent upon the soul's actual growth and unfoldment. Pictorial images appear. They indicate that inner progress has now so far advanced that the particular personality in question may reasonably believe that his soul has indeed acquired new powers. Taken alone, these images do not necessarily have much connection with the reality of those experiences through which the soul is passing. They are merely symbols, such as may come during the sleep state. But in a certain way they are typical symbols, similar to those that occur under certain conditions when we have very distinct and positive dreams. For instance, a person suffering from palpitation of the heart may during sleep be under an illusion that heat is emanating from some glowing source, as for instance a hot stove. In like manner, when the soul has gained this or that special clairvoyant power, then will come corresponding definite experiences in the form of visionary manifestations. In the case of Naboth, the first event of this nature brought with it a full realization of all that is implied in the following, quote, Thou art the chosen one. Through whom it shall be proclaimed that human beings may still believe in the ancient Yahweh God, and that they must hold fast to this faith, even though it outwardly seemeth that because of the sore tribulation come upon the land, the current of life's happenings be set against such trust. Humanity must now rest in peace till times may mend, for though it is the will of Yahweh, the God of old, to come with affliction, Nevertheless, shall humanity again rejoice, but they must be steadfast of faith in the Lord God. Close quote. It was evident to Naboth that this proclamation that should come through him was undoubtedly the expression of a true and unswerving force, carrying a conviction that lay deep within his soul. This experience stood out vividly as something more than a mere vision. Then before his soul there arose an image of God himself, in that form and manner in which it was within his power to picture him. The presence said, quote, Go thou to King Ahab, and say unto him that in the God Yahweh must he have faith, until such time as he may again bring rain upon the earth. Close quote. In other words, until conditions should improve. Naboth realized the nature of his mission. He knew also that from that time on he must devote himself to the further unfolding of that power of soul through which he might apprehend and interpret all that was yet to be presented to his spiritual vision. He resolved that he would shun no sacrifice, but as much as he could he would share in the sufferings of those who were exposed to the greatest measure of want and starvation during that time. Thus it came about that Naboth also hungered, but he did not seek thereby to rise to a higher spiritual state. Such a process, I would state, is most certainly not to be recommended as a step toward higher spiritual knowledge and understanding. He hungered because of an impulse that made him desire to suffer as others did. He thus wa wanted to share in the common fate, and it was his earnest wish to take upon himself 
a measure of adversity greater than that endured by those around him. The soul of Naboth was given over to unceasing inner contemplation of that God who had revealed himself to him in the manner described, and his thoughts were ever concentrated upon this deity. The spiritual science of our time would say that throughout his meditations he devoted himself entirely and of his own free will to holding this divine concept in the very center of his soul. That he acted rightly in doing so was made clear to him by a sign that came during an inner vision. This vision was again more positive than any of merely dreamlike character. For an image of that God who dwelt within his soul appeared before him, and it was full of life. A voice said, Abide in patience and endure all things, for he who feedeth humanity and thee also will surely provide that which thou needest. But thou must ever hold to a true faith in the soul's eternal life. In this vision, which was of greater pictorial reality than any that came before, it appeared to him, whom we may now under the singular conditions that prevailed term Elijah Naboth, that he was led by a hermit to the brook called Cherith. Uh, Readers aside, spelled C-H-E-R-I-T-H. I'm going to say Cherith. And readers aside, where he concealed himself and drank of the waters of the brook so long as any remained, and that he was nourished, so far as the conditions prevailing at the time permitted, by food the Lord provided. It further seemed to him, during the vision, that through the special mercy of God this nutriment was brought by ravens. Thus did Elijah Naboth receive confirmation of the truth of the most important among those inner experiences he was destined to encounter. It was next ordained that Naboth should pass through a more advanced stage of development in relation to the activities of the hidden soul forces. And we know that he endeavored to immerse himself yet more deeply, as we would now explain it, in that condition of intensive contemplation that lay at the foundation of his spiritual progress, the character of which we have already described. This state of profound meditation, fraught with inner life experiences, assumed the following form. Naboth pondered thus, If you would indeed become worthy of that mission that will shine in upon humanity because of this wholly new concept of God's image, then must you change utterly the nature of your inner being, even to the most profound of its forces, so that you are no more as you have been, you will subdue the soul that dwells in you and through those deeper powers within bring to your inner ego a new life for it may no longer remain as it now is. You must uplift its quality. Close quote. Under the influence of thoughts such as these Naboth worked intensively upon his soul striving within that he might bring about this essential transformation of his ego and thus become worthy to stand in the presence of that God who had revealed himself before him. Then came to Elijah Naboth yet another experience that was, however, only in part a vision. Because it was not entirely of the nature of an inner soul happening, there being other content, it must be regarded as of less spiritual significance. It is always the pure inner workings of the soul that are of truest and greatest import. In this vision it appeared to him that his God, who had again manifested, set him upon a journey to Zarephath, 1 Kings 17.9. And in that place he met a widow who had a son. He saw represented or personified, as it were, in the fate of this widow and her son, the manner and way in which he was now to live. It seemed to his spiritual sight that their food was almost spent. The food they had was about to be consumed, after which they would die. Then it was that he spoke to the widow as in a dream, a vision, using in effect those same words that day by day and week by week, throughout his solitary meditations, he had repeated over and over again to his own soul, 
fear not. From the meal that remains, prepare the repast that must be made ready for you and your son, and for me also. In all that may yet come to pass, trust alone in that God who creates both joy and sorrow, and in whom we must ever abide in faith. In this dreamlike vision, it was clearly impressed upon Elijah Naboth that the barrel of meal would not become empty, nor would the cruise of oil fail, for the oil and the meal would be renewed. It is worth noting that at this point his whole soul state, which had become, so to speak, fully developed and perfected with regard to his individual character, expressed itself in the vision in such manner that it seemed to him as if his personality went to live in the upper part of the house that belonged to the widow. The inner truth was that his own soul had, one might say, risen to a higher level and achieved a more advanced stage of development. It next appeared to Elijah Naboth, again as in a vision, that the son of the widow lay dead. This we must regard as merely a symbolic representation of the fact that Naboth had overcome and slain the ego that had been his up to that time. Then the subconscious forces in his soul cried out, quote, What will you do now? Close quote. For a while Elijah Naboth stood helpless and perplexed. But he was able to regain his self-control through the medium of the power that had always lived and flowed within his innermost being, and to plunge yet more profoundly into the consideration of those conditions that called for such deep and earnest contemplation. It then happened that after the widow's son was dead, she reproached him. This signifies that his subconscious spirit reproached him, in other words, aroused in him a misgiving of this nature, My old ego consciousness has now left me. What am I to do? In the description given of these events, it is stated that he took the child to himself and plunged unhesitatingly still further into the depths of his soul. We are told that power was given to him through which he brought the dead son once more to life. Then did he gain more courage to stimulate and enliven the new ego that was now his by virtue of those qualities that were in the ego that he had lost. From that time on, Elijah Naboth continued to develop and mature the hidden forces of his soul so that it might acquire that inner strength necessary to come before the outer world and utter those words all must hear. But in the first place, and above everything, he had to stand before King Ahab and bring to a crisis the matter that had now to be decided, namely, the victory of the new Yahweh concept over those beliefs that the king himself accepted and which, owing to the weakness of the times, had become generally acknowledged among the people. It came about that while Ahab was making a round of his empire, anxiously observing the signs of want and distress, the personality, whom we have called Elijah Naboth, approached him. No man knew from whence he came. Certainly the king had no idea. And there was a strangeness in the manner of his speech that affected the soul of Ahab, who was not, however, aware that this man was his neighbor. More strongly than ever did the king experience that feeling of awe and dread that had always come upon him when reference was made to that great spirit known in the Bible as Elijah the prophet. Then it was that the king spoke and said, quote, Art you he that troubles Israel? Close quote. And Elijah Naboth replied, quote, No, not I, but you yourself it is who brings misfortune and evil upon the people, and it must now be determined to which God they shall turn. Close quote. So it was that a great multitude of the tribe of Israel assembled on Mount Carmel so that final judgment should be made between the God of Ahab and the God of Elijah. The decision was to be brought about by means of an external sign, but such a sign as all might plainly discern and clearly understand. To enter into details concerning these matters at the present time would, however, take us too far. It was arranged that the priests and prophets of Baal, the name by which the god of King Ahab was known, 
should be the first to offer a sacrifice. The people would then wait and see if the performance of certain sacrificial rites, parenthesis, religious exercises, in which the priests, through the medium of music and dancing, worked themselves up into a state of singular ecstasy, close parenthesis, would lead to any communication or influence being imparted to the multitude. In other words, the people were to judge whether or not, by virtue of inherent divine powers possessed by the priests, any sign was given of the might and potency of their God. The sacrificial beast was brought to the altar. It was to be decided if in truth the priests of Baal were endowed with an inner force such as would stir the multitude. Then Elijah Naboth raised up his voice and said, quote, This thing must now be determined. I stand alone, while opposed to me are the four hundred and fifty prophets of Baal. We shall see how strong is their hold upon the people, and how great is that power which is in me. Close quote. The sacrifice was performed, and everything possible done in order to transmit to the multitude a potent influence from the priests, that all should believe in the god Baal. The ecstatic exercises were carried to such lengths that the hands and other parts of the body were cut with knives until the blood flowed, so as to increase still further the awesome character of the spectacle evoked by these followers of Baal, under the frenzied stimulus of the dancing and the music. But behold, there was no sign, for Elijah Naboth was there, and the spirit within within him was at work. In words insufficient of expression, one might say that while Elijah Naboth stood near at hand, he caused a great spiritual power to flow forth from his being, so that he overcame and swept away all things opposed to him. In this case you must not, however, imagine to yourselves the exercise of any kind of magic. Elijah Naboth then prepared his sacrifice. He made an offering to his God, using the full force of his soul that soul which had passed through all those trials we have already described. The sacrifice was consummated and achieved the fullness of its purpose, for the souls and the hearts of the people were stirred. The priests of Baal, the four hundred and fifty opponents of Elijah, were driven to admit defeat. They were destroyed in their very souls by that which they had desired, killed, as it were, by Elijah Naboth. Elijah Naboth had won the day. These events were in some ways similar to those that I have endeavored to portray in my book entitled Mysticism After Modernism. While speaking of the German mystic theologian Johannes Tauler, it is there related that for a considerable period during his life he was known as a remarkable and trenchant preacher, and that at one time he gave himself up to a particular form of training after which, upon his return to the pulpit, he exercised upon one occasion such an extraordinary influence upon his congregation that we are told some forty persons collapsed as if dead. This signifies that their innermost beings were touched and that they were overcome by the sympathetic action of a special power emanating from the great divine. With such an example before us, We need no longer imagine that the Bible account concerning Ahab and Elijah is a mere exaggeration, for it is at all times entirely confirmed by the researches of spiritual science. What follows as the natural outcome of all these events? I have already described the character and peculiar nature of Jezebel. She was quite aware of the fact that the man who had done all these things was their neighbor, and that he was to be found living close at hand, that is, when he was not mysteriously absent. What did Elijah Naboth know and realize from that moment? He knew that Jezebel was powerful and that she had discovered his secret. In other words, he felt that henceforth his outer physical life was no longer safe. He must therefore prepare for death in the near future, for Jezebel would certainly bring about his destruction. King Ahab went home and, as related in the Bible, told Jezebel about the events that had taken place on Mount Carmel. 
Spiritual science tells us that Jezebel said, quote, I will do to Elijah that which he did to your 450 prophets, close quote. Who could understand these words spoken by Jezebel, Jezebel and reflected in 1 Kings 19.2, were it not for the investigations made by spiritual science, in whose light their meaning seems almost self-evident, bracket, As a result of these researches, it is quite clear, and this point has always been obscure, why it was that Jezebel brought about the death of Naboth, when in reality she sought to destroy Elijah. From spiritual science, however, we realize that she sent her threatening message to Elijah Naboth, because by virtue of her clairvoyant powers, she knew full well that the physical body of Naboth was the bearer of Elijah's spirit. Close bracket. It now became necessary for Elijah to form definite plans whereby he could avoid being immediately done to death as a result of Jezebel's revenge. He at once had to arrange that in case of this event happening, his spirit could still continue to carry on his teachings and exert its influence upon humanity. When next he communed inwardly with his soul, and while in a state of intense inner contemplation, he questioned himself thus, quote, What shall I do that I may find a successor to fulfill my mission in this physical world? Should my death indeed be brought about through the vengeance of Jezebel? Close quote. Then a new revelation came to him, in which his inner vision was directed toward a certain quite definite personality, to whom Elijah Naboth might pass on all that he had to bestow upon mankind. This personality was Elisha. You may think it possible that Elijah had previously known Elisha. I'm going to, uh, readers aside, I will pronounce that Elisha. It might be Elisha. And readers aside, let me read that again. You may think it possible that Elijah had previously known Elisha. Whether such was the case or not is a matter of little importance. What is of moment is the fact that it was the spirit that pointed to the way and that he heard, through an inner illumination, these words, quote, Initiate this man into your secrets. Close quote. We are further told with the clarity that marks the statements of spiritual science concerning ancient religious records, that Elijah Naboth had a very special mission to fulfill, and that the divine element that was about to descend upon Elisha would be of the same spirit as had previously been predominant in Elijah. It was in Damascus that Elisha was to be sought, and in that place he would receive this great spiritual illumination, which would come to him in the same way as that glorious divine light that flowed in upon St. Paul at a later period. Soon after Elijah had chosen his successor, the vengeance of Jezebel fell upon him, for Jezebel turned the thoughts of her lord toward Naboth, their neighbor, and spoke to Ahab somewhat in this fashion, Listen to me. This neighbor is a pious man whose mind is filled with ideas concerning Elijah. It would perhaps be well to remove him from this vicinity, for he is one of the most important of his followers, and upon him much depends. The king knew nothing whatever about the secret that surrounded Naboth, but he was quite aware by this time that he was indeed a faithful adherent of Elijah's and gave heed to his words. Jezebel next urged Ahab to try to induce Naboth to come over to his side, either by methods of persuasion or, if necessary, by exercising his power of kingly authority. She said, quote, It would be a great blow to the schemes and projects of this man Elijah if by any means it were possible to draw him away from his intents. Jezebel knew quite well, however, that all her talk was the merest fiction. What she really desired was to induce her lord to take some kind of definite and effective action. It was not this particular move in which she was interested. Her mind was bent upon a plot that was to follow. Thus the advice she tendered was of the nature of a subterfuge. After Jezebel had spoken in this way to Ahab, the king went to Naboth and spoke with him. Naboth, however, would not regard what he said and replied, quote, uh, Never shall those things come to pass that you desire. Close quote. 
In the Bible, the position is so represented that this neighbor of Ahab's is described as possessing a vineyard that the king coveted and sought to acquire. According to this account, 1 Kings 21.3, Naboth said to Ahab, quote, that Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Close quote. In reality, however, the actual inheritance to which reference is made was of quite another kind than that which Naboth declined to surrender. Nevertheless, Jezebel used this incident as the foundation of her revenge. She deliberately gave false counsel so that the king might be disconcerted and then angered by Naboth's refusal. That such was the case becomes evident when we read that passage in the Bible, 1 Kings 21.4, where it is written, quote, And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased, because of the word which Naboth, the Jezreelite, had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. Close quote. Think of that. Merely because the king could not obtain a certain vineyard in his neighborhood, he refused to eat? We can begin to understand such statements only when we are in a position to investigate the facts underlying them. It was at this point that Jezebel took definite steps to bring about her revenge. She started by arranging that a feast be given to which Naboth should be invited and at which he was to be an especially honored guest. 1 Kings 21.12 Naboth could not refuse to be present, and at this feast it was planned that he be afforded an opportunity of expressing himself freely. Jezebel was truly gifted with clairvoyant insight. With the others, Naboth could easily cope. With them, he could measure forces. But Jezebel had the power to bring ruin upon him. She introduced false witnesses, who declared that, quote, Naboth did deny, blaspheme, God and the king, close quote. It was in this manner that she contrived to bring about his murder, as is related in the Bible, 1 King 21, 13. Henceforth, the outer physical personality of Elijah was dead and was no more seen upon the face of the external world. Because of all that had happened, the deep forces in Ahab's soul were stirred. He was confronted with the grave question of his destiny, while at the same time he experienced a strange and unusual foreboding. Then Elijah, whom he had always regarded with feelings of awe, appeared as in a vision and revealed to him plainly how the matter stood. Here we have an actual spiritual experience in which Ahab was accused by the spirit form of Elijah, subsequent to his death, of having virtually himself murdered Naboth, this Naboth Elijah. The connection with the latter personality he could but dimly realize, nevertheless, Ahab was definitely termed his murderer. In the Bible, we can read the dreadful words that fell upon his soul during this awe-inspiring prophecy when the spirit form said, quote, In the place where dogs licked the blood of Naboth shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. Close quote. 1 Kings 21.19 Then came yet another dire, dire prophetic utterance, quote, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Close quote, 1 Kings 21:23. We now know of these predictions. Be, excuse me. We now know that these predictions belong to a class that finds ultimate fulfillment. For subsequently, when King Ahab went forth to battle against the Syrians, he was wounded. His blood ran out of the wound into the chariot, and he died. When the chariot was being washed, dogs came and licked up his blood. 1 Kings 22, 35, and 38. Later on, after a further course of events had made Jehu ruler of Jezreel, Jezebel was seen as she stood at a window. She was seized and thrown down, and dogs tore her to pieces and actually devoured her before the walls of the city. 2 Kings 9, 30 through 37. I have touched lightly upon these matters because our time is short and they are of no special importance to us just now. You will find that the subject I am about to consider is of much greater moment. He whom Elijah Naboth had elected to be his successor had then to develop and perfect his inner being, even as Elijah Naboth himself had done. But this spiritual unfolding was brought about in a different way. 
For the pupil it was in some way less difficult than it had been for his teacher, since all the power that Elijah Naboth had acquired through constant upward striving was now at his disciple's disposal, and he had the help and support of his great master. Elijah Naboth influenced Elisha in the same way as the individualities of those who have passed through the portals of death may at times act upon humanity, namely by means of a special form of spiritual activity emanating directly from the spirit world. The divine force that descended upon Elisha was similar in nature to the glorious inspiration that Christ Jesus himself gave to his disciples after his resurrection. Elisha's subsequent experiences were directly related to this divine power that continued to flow forth from Elijah even after his death, and to affect all who might give themselves up to its potent influence. With Elisha, his experience was such that the living form of his great master appeared before his soul and said, quote, I will go forth with thee out of Gilgal. Close quote. At this point I quote the Bible literally, where it says Second Kings two one quote, and it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Close quote. Gilgal is not a place or locality, and it is not intended in the Bible that it should be taken as such. The word Gilgal, readers aside, spelled G-I-L-G-A-L, end of readers aside, merely signifies the act of moving in a circuitous path while revolving, as in waltzing. This technical expression refers to the roundabout course of the soul's life during those periods in which it is incarnated in the flesh and passes from one physical body to another. That is the true significance of Gilgal. It need cause you no surprise that the results obtained through spiritual, spiritual science show that Elisha, by virtue of soul experiences gained through inner contemplation and absolute devotion, could be in the actual presence of Elijah in a higher state or world. This was made possible not because of the forces latent in his physical nature, but through those more exalted powers he possessed. While Elisha was thus uplifted, the steps that he had to take toward his soul's development were pointed out to him by the spirit of Elijah, who constantly drew his attention to the difficulties he would encounter on the path he must follow. The way led upward and onward, step by step, to a stage where he would first feel himself unified with that divine spirit always flowing forth from his great teacher, Elijah. The names, apparently referring to places that have been chosen, bracket in the Bible such as Bethel and Jericho, 2 Kings 2, 2 and 4, close bracket, are not to be taken as designating localities, but in their literal sense, signifying conditions of the soul. For instance, Elijah says, quote, I will now take me to Bethel, close quote. The statement was made to Elisha in a vision, but to him it was more than a mere vision. Then, again, as if counseling him, the spirit of Elijah spoke and said, quote, It were better to remain here. Close quote. The true significance of this statement is this, quote, Consider whether you possess the strength to go with me further, close quote, referring to the spiritual path. The vision then continues with an incident in which we again find something in the nature of an exhortation and warning. All the sons of the prophets, who were his colleagues in the spirit, stood about Elisha and cautioned him, and those who were initiated into the mystery and knew that at times he could indeed ascend to the higher regions, where the spirit of Elijah conversed with him, admonished him and told him that this time he would not be able to follow Elijah. Quote, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? Close quote, Second Kings 2 Kings 2.3. His answer was, quote, Hold ye your peace. Close quote. But to the spirit of Elijah he said, quote, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not love, leave thee. Close quote. Elijah spoke again and said, quote, The Lord has sent me to Jericho. Close quote, Second Kings 2 Kings 2.4. 
Once again, this dialogue is repeated and the word Jordan is introduced, 2 Kings 2.6, after which Elijah asks, quote, Ask what I shall do for thee. Close quote. The reply Elisha gave is recorded in the Bible, but in such a manner that we have to drag out its proper meaning, for it is rendered incorrectly. The words are these, quote, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Close quote, 2 Kings 2.9. The actual answer, however, was this, quote, I desire that thy spirit shall enter and dwell as a second spirit within my soul. Close quote. The essence of Elisha's request, as understood by Elijah, was somewhat as follows. Elisha had asked that his soul be stirred to its very depths and enlivened so that he might awaken to a full consciousness of its true relation to the spirit of his master. It could then, of its own powers, bring about enlightenment concerning spiritual revelation, even as had been the case during the physical life of his great teacher. Elijah spoke again and said to this effect, I must now ascend into the higher realms. If thou art able to perceive my spirit as it rises upward, then hast thou attained thy desire, and my power will enter in unto thee. And Elisha indeed saw the spirit of Elijah as he, quote, went up by a whirlwind into heaven, close quote, 2 Kings 2.11. And the mantle of Elijah fell down upon him, which was a symbol denoting the spiritual force in which he must now enwrap himself. Here then we have a spiritual vision that indicated and at the same time caused Elisha to realize that he might now indeed become the true successor of Elijah. In the Bible, 2 Kings 2.15, we read, at, quote, And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Close quote. This passage points to the fact that the word of the Lord had become so mighty in Elisha that it was filled with the same force that the sons of the prophets had experienced with Elijah, and they realized that the spirit of Elijah Naboth truly lived on in the being of Elisha. In previous lectures, I described the methods employed by spiritual science. As we proceed, they will be further elucidated. The foregoing account gives expression to its testimony regarding the actual events that took place in Elijah's name and also concerning the impulse to humanity that flowed forth from that great prophet and his successor, Elisha. This impulse always tended toward the renewing and uplifting of the ancient Yahweh faith. It is characteristic of that ancient period that incidents such as we have portrayed, and which could be understood only by the initiated, were represented to the mass of the people who were quite incapable of comprehending them in their true form, in such a manner as to render them intelligible, and at the same time to cause them to work upon and to influence the soul. The method to which I refer is that of parables or miracle stories. But what seems to us so truly amazing, in the highest spiritual sense, is that out of such allegorical narratives there should have been evolved an account like that relating to Elijah, Elisha, and Naboth as told in the Bible. In those days, it was the custom to use the parable form when speaking to all who could not understand or realize the supreme glory of the impulse that had come from the souls of these great ones, spiritual beings who of themselves had first to undergo many inner experiences deeply hidden from human external vision and apprehension. Thus it was that the people were told, as may be gathered from the Bible, that Elijah lived in the time of King Ahab, and that during a period of famine the god Yahweh appeared before him and, as spiritual science tells us, commanded him to go to the ki king Ahab and say to him, quote, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Close quote. 1 Kings 17.1 the account in the Bible continues as follows, quote, And the word of the Lord 
came into him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Kareth, that is, before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Close quote, 1 Kings 17, 2 through 4. These things came about. When the brook was dried up, God sent Elijah to Zarephath. 1 Kings 17, 9. Quote, in the third year, close quote, he was commanded to set out and appear before King Ahab, 1 Kings 18.1, and to cause the 450 prophets of Baal to be called to a final decision, 1 Kings 18.19. I have previously referred to all this when presenting the facts as obtained through spiritual science. Next comes a wonderful picture of the events that actually took place on Mount Carmel, 1 Kings 1820-39, which I have described. Then follows the story of how Naboth, who was in reality the bearer of the spirit of Elijah, was to be robbed of his vineyard by Ahab, and of how Jezebel brought ruin upon him. 1 Kings 21, 1-14. From the Bible account alone we cannot understand how Jezebel could possibly have accomplished the destruction of Elijah in accordance with her threatening utterance to King Ahab namely that she would do to Elijah that which he did to Ahab's 450 prophets. The story tells us that she merely effected the death of Naboth. As a matter of fact, however, she actually brought destruction to the being in whom dwelt at that time the spirit of Elijah. This point would undoubtedly escape the notice of any ordinary biblical student, for in the Bible it merely states that Elijah ascended into heaven. 2 Kings 2.11 if, as is intimated in the Bible, Jezebel's desire was to do to Elijah what he had done to the 450 prophets of Baal, she certainly accomplished her end and brought about his ruin in a most remarkable manner. Footnote. It has been previously stated, page 161 of this book, that through Elijah and Naboth the prophets of Baal were, quote, destroyed in their very souls by that which they had desired, close quote. Elijah longed that his spirit might continue to be active in the being of Naboth. And it was this very wish that caused Jezebel to set about his ruin and thus, as it were, to destroy Elijah in his very soul. It was not merely physical death to which Jezebel referred when she sent her message to Elijah, saying, quote, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Close quote, 1 Kings 19.2. She referred to a kind of spiritual death, which would break forever that mysterious and sacred union between Elijah and Naboth that it was her aim to sever. She knew quite well by virtue of her clairvoyant powers that she could hope to accomplish this end and, quote, destroy Elijah in his very soul, close quote, only by bringing about the material dissolution of Naboth, the bearer of Elijah's spirit. Thus we find that if we read Jezebel's message anew in the light throne of spiritual science, its purport becomes at once intelligible. End of footnote. I would here state that there are some graphic portrayals relative to the dim past that can be rightly understood only when illumined by the bright radiance that flows from the deep sources of spiritual research. It is not possible in a single lecture to bring forward further evidence and proofs concerning these matters. If, however, those among my audience who may still feel that they cannot look upon the pronouncements of spiritual science as other than hypotheses would but criticize without prejudice and set about comparing the various statements made with facts obtained through the medium of spiritual, excuse me, of external science, I should feel entirely satisfied. Although it is true that if spiritual methods of research are not employed, we cannot hope to reach final and positive conclusions, it will still be found that the truth of spiritual science is confirmed by the results of orthodox scientific investigations and the proper exercise of individual intelligence. When we study the personality and period of the prophet Elijah, it becomes clear that the impulses and primal causes that underlie and bring about human events are in no way limited to those occurrences that, were out, that are outwardly apparent and therefore find a place in the records of external history. 
By far the most important and significant happenings connected with human existence had their actual origin and are matured with respect to a primary stage within the confines of the soul. The outcome of this fundamental process next finds expression in the outer world, spreading its influence further and further among the people. Although these days it is inconceivable that a mysterious personality such as we have portrayed and known only through rumor could dwell in our midst in the guise of a simple and homely neighbor without all the facts becoming known, in olden times such a circumstance was undoubtedly possible. We have learned that throughout all human evolution it is precisely those forces that are of greatest power and intensity which operate in an obscure and secret fashion. From what has been said it is clear that through the influence of the prophet Elijah human beings were raised to a higher spiritual level and became more and more imbued with Yahweh thoughts and concepts. We also realize that the life and deeds of that great patriarch when viewed in the proper manner, must be regarded as forming an epoch of supreme import to humanity. Further investigation and research will assuredly prove that, by means of the methods of spiritual science, a new light has been thrown upon the momentous happenings of a bygone age and on the events that ultimately led to the founding of Christianity. We know that through realities of this nature, born of the spirit world, we can draw nearer to an understanding of those fundamental forces and impulses that have been active in the course of the evolution of humanity and therefore appear to us of such great significance and moment. Then, with enhanced knowledge, we shall realize that even as these basic actors have operated in remote antiquity, so must they continue to work on in our present period. Never can we read the deep secrets of the life around us as if we have no clear concept of the inner nature and purport of those singular events that have taken place in the dim and distant past. External history, which is garnered solely from the outer world, does not enlighten us concerning matters of greatest and most vital import. It is here that the words of Goethe so fittingly apply words that, if they are read with a touch of deeper meaning, become a call to humanity, urging us to profound inner spiritual contemplation. For it is thus that human beings may enter upon that quest which alone can spring from the soul's most hidden depths, and learn to apprehend the divine spirit that exists and abides in all nature. The wonderful example of the prophet Elijah and his period, as it shines forth in our spiritual firmament, stands as evidence of the truth of Goethe's words, which in slightly modified form are as follows. Quote, History will not permit that veil to be withdrawn, which hides her secrets from the light of our new day. That which she chooses from thy spirit to conceal, canst thou ne'er wrest from parchment script, nor canst thou say. What message lies secreted neath those mystic signs, inscribed on bronze or fashioned deep in stone or clay. Close quote. Footnote, I'm going to give the German a try. Geheimnisvoll am lichten Tag der Gegenwart lässt Geschichte sich des Schleiers nicht berauben, was sie deinem Geist nicht offenbaren mag, das zwingst du ihr nicht aus Pergamenten und nicht aus Zeichen, die eingeschrieben sind in Erz und Ton und Stein. And a footnote, and that is the end of the lecture, Elijah. There is an addendum. I don't believe that's by Steiner. I think it's probably by Mr. Harry Collison, but I'm not sure. I'll read this. In this lecture, which was delivered in Berlin in 1911, it will be noticed that in some cases the name Elijah Naboth is found in places where only Elijah is mentioned in the Bible. The reason for this apparent inconsistency becomes at once evident when we take a general view of the circumstances and singular, singular relationship that existed between Elijah and Naboth, and what we might term a duality of being as expressed in Elijah Naboth. 
Let us therefore briefly consider the events portrayed in the order in which they took place. At the time of Ahab, the Hebrew people were for the most part so far sunk in materialism that there was danger not only that disaster would overtake them, but also that the actual course of the spiritual evolution of humankind might be hindered. The matter had gone to such a length as to call for divine intervention. For this reason it was ordained that Elijah, whom we must regard as a truly exalted spirit, should descend upon the earth and that his mission would be to turn the hearts of the people once more to Yahweh and to determine his, Elijah's, successor. This mission we may look upon as being accomplished in four stages. At first the spirit of Elijah worked in mysterious ways, for he appeared among the people now here and now there. No man knew from whence he came. In those days the masses were often moved in matters concerning religious thought by engendering feelings of awe and wonder, and by so doing Elijah established a definite and powerful influence among the minds of the community. He thus prepared the people to witness the sign of the Spirit that it was decreed should be imparted. Only through a great manifestation of divine force could the nation in that material state into which it had fallen be brought back to Yahweh, the ancient God of the Hebrews. In the second stage of Elijah's mission, we come upon the simple landowner, Naboth. In order to create the utmost possible impression at the time when the supreme revelation of spiritual power should take place, it was essential that a multitude be present. But for this thing to happen, it was necessary to gain the consent of the king. Now, Naboth lived near Ahab and might on occasion obtain audience with him. In this manner, he could aid Elijah in the maturing of his plans. Elijah, therefore, so worked upon the innermost soul of Naboth that he became, quote, the bearer of his spirit, close quote, and did according to his word. Thus did Elijah's spirit find expression through the outer form of Naboth and bring influence to bear upon the king that all should be made ready for the people to be gathered together when the moment was at hand for the sign to be given. It is the dual state of Naboth's being while the spirit of Elijah was dominant and worked within him that has been termed Elijah Naboth. Ahab was not truly clairvoyant and had no suspicion of all that had occurred. On that occasion when he met Elijah Naboth and said to him, quote, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Close quote, 1 Kings 18.17 He thought it was only Naboth who was speaking and that it was he who would turn the people against the gods of Baal. Ahab at that time merely knew of Elijah through indefinite rumor. But it was the voice of Elijah the prophet speaking through Naboth that answered the king. It was Elijah Naboth that spoke. It is because the ancient writer who portrayed this incident did not realize the singular spiritual and clairvoyant conditions and therefore did not fully understand the circumstances that the name of Elijah alone appears in this account as in other Bible accounts connected with the events that took place in those days. We find a similar difference in the names occurring in the description of the happening on Mount Carmel, when the people were assembled to judge between Jehovah and the gods of Baal. It was then that the third stage of Elijah's mission was fulfilled. In the lecture it is stated that it was Elijah Naboth who was present on Mount Carmel, and that it was he who, quote, won the day, close quote. But the Bible narrative tells us that it was Elijah himself who overcame the prophets of Baal. The reason for this apparent inconsistency can be seen from the following considerations. It was Elijah Naboth who, when all had come, stood forth and said, quote, This thing must now be determined. I stand alone while opposed to me are the four hundred and fifty prophets of Baal, close quote. But Elijah, who was granted special spiritual powers at that moment, so ordered the matter that while the king saw before him merely the outer form of the man Naboth, the people were impressed with the spiritual being and personality of Elijah. In the Bible, the narrator realized the circumstances as the multitude had apprehended them and therefore spoke only of Elijah being unaware at that time that Naboth was, quote, the bearer of his spirit, close quote. 
Jezebel was not present at Mount Carmel because she was conscious that she could not cope directly with Elijah. Through her clairvoyant powers she was cognizant of all that had come to pass, and she knew full well that the spirit of the great prophet would be all-powerful in that place. In other words, she clearly understood that if she went to Mount Carmel, she would there have to do with Elijah Naboth, and not merely with a simple landowner. She thought, however, that if she could only effect the physical death of Naboth, she might put an end to Elijah's influence. Next came the fourth stage of Elijah's mission. He must seek a successor, and do so before Jezebel brought about the death of Naboth. For when the outer form of Naboth should be destroyed, Elijah must return to the divine spirit realms. At that point in the lecture, page 163, where it states that Elijah communed with his soul and asked the question, quote, What shall I do that I may find a successor to fulfill my mission in the physical world, should my death indeed be brought about through the vengeance of Jezebel? Close quote. He is referring to the material death of Naboth and to the possible premature ending of the impulse he had wrought. Further, we are told that spiritual science states that, quote, Elijah Naboth had a very special mission to fulfill, and that the divine element that was about to descend upon Elisha would be of the same spirit as had previously been predominant in Elijah. Close quote. We are told that, quote, it was in Damascus that Elisha was to be sought. Close quote. In the Bible, 1 Kings 19.15 and 16, we find these words. Quote, and the Lord said unto him, Elijah, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Maholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. Close quote. The actual command to seek out Elisha was given in a vision to Elijah, as is indicated both in the lecture and in 1 Kings 19, 12, and 13. Spiritual science, however, tells us that it was Elijah Naboth who made the journey. This is quite comprehensible when we realize that in Elijah Naboth, Elisha, by virtue of his advanced spirituality, would know and commune with the spirit being of Elijah. Here again it is for reasons similar to those already advanced that in the Bible the name of Elijah only occurs, while in the lecture Elijah Naboth is mentioned. In all such cases it will be found, if we but look deeply into the matter, that the statements of spiritual science are in truth not in any way at variance with those written in the Bible. <laughs>